immediately going to be used, they will be um, some point very soon. All right. Um, the first one is, eh, you know what, we'll skip those. Um, we'll review them at some point, but um, what I want you to do is review on your own the concepts of inheritance and interfaces, okay? Um, because uh, we'll, we'll discuss those at some point. All right. I was scanning the code. I thought there was a use of an interface somewhere, but um, I think I'm mistaken. So we won't talk about that now. All right. Chapter two. Um, there's really not tons in chapter two that um, I, I, I think are critical for this class. So um, feel free to skim it. I mentioned a couple of things for you uh, that I specifically want to highlight. Uh, there's a section on best practices. It talks about best practices for apps, widgets, GUIs, etc. There's also best practices for icons. All right. I can't recall if that's in the book or not. Um, that's something I would like you to do some investigation on. Uh, one thing I announced uh, on Angel is I will not be here Thursday. So there's no class on Thursday. I have made an online activity for you to do. Um, Essentially, I want you to internationalize or localize for some other language other than English um, your rock, paper, scissors application. And then the other thing I want you to do is I want you to create an icon for it after you've researched and, and found the guidelines for good icon making. Shouldn't be that big of a deal. I, I would think that a little bit of research, you could probably wrap it up within the normal lecture time, I, I would expect. All right. I do have a question I want to ask the class. Um, I uh, am, I don't know how to, how to put this uh, precisely, but um, I'm involved with a family member's medical situation um, that might require me to um, either miss class or reschedule class. My, qu uh, my question is, would you prefer um, for me to like, have an online activity for certain days. That's what I did for this one. That's, that's one option. The other option would be like to push back the class, possibly until it didn't start until 7 or so. You would know in advance, by the way. And you don't have to give an answer now. You can think uh, about it. I don't know if any of you have any, have any classes following this one or not, or if you have other commitments that w would be difficult or whatever. And it isn't an all-or-nothing thing. In other words, we might do one of each in a, two, in, in a week period. You know, if I had to miss the whole week, we might do. So that's something to think about and provide feedback um, about that. This week I decided to have an online activity because I thought that was the simplest to do in, in the short term. We'll see. This is all a contingency. It's not nothing's definite. Yeah, I just wanted to put some feelers out uh, for this. Okay. Other thing in chapter two that's worth looking about that we won't explore in this class, but I would urge you to do on your own is um, get a Google Merchant account. It costs like 25 bucks, I think, and then you can, well, you know, still, hey, it's better than, it's better than uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Apple developer's account, which I think is like more like 100 bucks, all right? So for 25 bucks, you can get a developer's account, you can post to the Google Play Store. I did it just for the heck of it, just to do the experience. I made some real simple apps, just to put them out there and see how to do it. It's a good chance to do that, you know. Um, whether you want to do that for free or, you know, to, to put your apps out there for free or charge for them or whatever, um, it probably would be a good thing to do. All right. Take a few minutes to travel through the Google uh, App Store, Google Play, I believe it's called now. 
and you will find that pretty much no application that you could think of is too small or too dumb to be put out there. <laughs> All right. So, and some of them make good money, right. So who knows, maybe the world is waiting for uh, the chance to play rock, paper, and scissors against a computer opponent. So, you know, you may, you may, you may corner the, the market on that. All right, so that's about all that we're going to talk about, I think, in Chapter 2. Chapter 3, we looked at the welcome application. And um, there's only a few things I'm going to point out. Uh, about this. I'm going to point out the, the few sections of the book that I think uh, are important. Then we'll take a minute to look at the app, even though there really isn't a lot to the app. All right. I want you to look on page 81. Uh, page 81 talks about the different kinds of uh, layouts there are. All right. And again, my suggestion is, is, you know, use a graphical um, tool to um, create or layouts. That's fine with me. But you should at least somewhat be familiar with the code as well. Um, in, in my mind, sometimes GUIs hide essential things for you. You know, it does things for you, and it might not do it in uh, the best way, or it, it might be confusing how to do it. I found so many times it much easier just to dive into the code and, and look at it. So, you know, use it. That's fine. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, not telling you not to use it. But, but also know and be familiar with the code. So if you need to, you can jump over to the code view. On page 81, they describe the layouts. And the first one's a frame layout, which um, really just has a single component. And you can add more than one component, but each one gets overlaid on top of the other ones. So this is for some very simple sort of application that only has one thing going on or has things that you can overlay on top of each other. There is then a linear layout, which is the layout I used in my real simple calculator. And you can choose to orient the elements either vertically or horizontally. So in my example, uh, each element was oriented vertically. All right. Let's take a look at my tip calculator and take a look at that layout. And if you remember what it looked like on the screen, or I guess we can run it. All right. Notice that in looking at the layout, one thing is right after the other and they're stacked vertically. That is because I have defined a linear layout for this and I have said that the orientation of it is vertical. So that means that the text view, the edit text, the spinner, the checkbox, the text view, and so on down the line are all stacked on top of each other vertically. You can do the same thing to make them stacked horizontally uh, if, if you needed to do that. So that's a linear layout. Components are in a line, either vertically or horizontally. A relative layout is arranges components relative to one another or relative to their parent container. And that you can, uh, I, I'm less familiar with this than I am other layouts, I have to confess. Um, I believe in this, you can position things and you can say you want this control to be after that control, or you can want it below or above, or you can, you can state things that way. I, I have to say I haven't done a lot with that one yet. Um, so we'll come back to that. I'm sure there'll be an example of that in the book and, and uh, uh, we, can, we can review it in more detail. The other one is a table. And the difference between a table is that a table consists of a series of rows and in each row, you can put a series of components, all right? So if we look at the, their tip calculator, and I still click on the wrong one. If we 
we look at their tip calculator, which is in a table, I was going to say, I wonder how long it's going to be before I use this mouse trying to move on, on my computer. But if you notice that this in a table, here's a row, and there are two components in it. There's a label here, and then there's a text box. Here, there is label, label, label. Here, there's label, text box, text box, text box. Label, text box, text box, text box. Label, slider control, label, label text box, label, text box. So each uh, table consists of rows, and in each row you can put a number of different things. And then those different, the, the, the rows are stacked uh, vertically, and the things in the rows are stacked horizontally. Similar to an HTML table, but not, not really the same. All right. Now, for the welcome application, Let's see what they use. They use a relative layout. And in the relative layout, what we have is, first of all, we have a text view that contains some text, the text that we get from the welcome string. Then we have an image view, and that image view is positioned below the welcome text view. So again, the rel in the relative layout, you specify where things are relative to other controls. So if we look at the graphical layout, there is the um, text view that contains the welcome message. Here is the image view. And based on what is said in the... Um, layout, the, the image view gets positioned below the image. Oh, I'm sorry, before, below the text view. And then we have a, another image, which is our little bug here, which gets positioned below the little android man or woman. I'm not really sure. All right. And again, is the relative layout says position that one below the control. So you sort of have your first control as being the baseline, and you can position that, and then you go in and you position the other things relative to it by saying above, below, whatever. All right. So that's what is meant by a relative layout. This isn't a particularly elaborate one, but again, um, relative, it, it states the control and you position the control um, based on uh, some other control. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you can nest these if you needed to do an intricate layout. All right. So, um, you could put inside of a table a relative layout and do it that way. You know, you could put inside a table row. Pretty sure you can anyhow. I don't know if there are some restrictions with that, but I'm pretty sure that's fair game where you can nest it if you wanted to create uh, an elaborate sort of layout. Know that layouts like that sometimes can be very confusing uh, if you have to go back and maintain it. So it's kind of like nested tables in HTML. You might be able to do it, but it's not necessarily always advisable. If you look on page 84 in the book, they talk about the different screen densities that, that they've defined. All right. And what this relates to is this relates to the different drawable folders. We looked at this last time with, relate, uh, with, uh, with relation to the icon, but it is possible to have, um, for any of these images, different versions of the image for um, high density pixels, medium density pixels, and low density pixels. All right. So, that Android PNG, I could put, have a different lower res version in the low density pixel folder and a different one there. Then depending on the device and the density of the pixels on the device, it would use that particular image. All right. And the same thing happens with icons. Uh, I think we did that last time. We looked at the different icons and saw, you know, the high density was big, middle was in between, 
and the um, low was, was the smallest uh, density. Other than that, there's not a lot going on in this. This is pretty much all um, layout, right? Because all this does is this. Pop up. Pops that display up and the welcome message, the little android man and the bug. Right. Turn it this way. And it should reorient itself. All right. Okay. Looking at the code for this, like I said, there's not much in the code. All we do is we have our activity that has the onCreate um, on um, method that does something with the, the, the state of the instance so that you can, uh, you can remember some things about it if you go back to it. All right. And it sets the content view to this guy. Resources, layout, main. So this is in the resources folder under layout, the main XML. And it just pops it up. There's really no coding here. It just displays that window. All right. So this isn't very exciting. So we'll move, up, we'll move past this on to the next topic. Yeah, an application could consist of, of multiple activities. You know, um, they, they define an activity. In fact, if you mouse over this, yeah, you set the content view, yeah. And, and you could, based on certain events, you could, you could trigger other activities uh, to happen. An activity is a single focus thing that a user can do. Almost all interactivity activities interact with the user, so the activity class takes care of creating a window for you in which you can place your UI with set content view. All right, and so on. So if you think within uh, within an application, uh, you know, uh, an Android application, um, if you had several things that the user could do, they probably would each be an activity. All right. For example. Um, I belong to a, a site, Goodreads. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that one. It's a, it's a good site. You can go on and you can like rate books that you've read and it will give you recommendations based on what other people have read and you can like become, you know, social networking so you can like become friends with other people and see what they're reading and get recommendations and all that. But there's different things that you can do on that site. One thing that you can do is you can uh, go in and create a, a user profile for yourself, all right? Another thing you could do is search for books. Another thing that you could do is add a book to one of your lists. Like you could say that you've read it, or you can say you want to read it, or that you currently read it. Each one of those is like an individual thing that you want the user to do. And I would imagine each one of those would correspond to an activity in the application. All right. So, about done with this one, we'll move past this and go on to their tip calculator. Now, notice in their tip calculator, notice first off, just to contrast it with mine, they have everything in the activity, all the code to do the calculations and the activity and all that. I guess it's okay because this is simple enough. This is basic just math. There's no real 
business rules per se is just take 15% of this number. So, yeah, I can I can forgive them for not having a business class for that. All right. Um, let's look at their layout and notice that they are using a table view. Oh, I'm sorry, table layout. And the table layout is consists of a series of table rows. And those table rows, you can then put different things, different elements. So for example, this table row here consists of this, the little label that says the bill, and then a, a text area where you can enter in the amount of the bill. So that's the first row. I'm going to close these other ones that might confuse me. All right. Row one, then, consists of that little sliver there that is the labels for the different, um, different um, tip amounts. Let's run this application so that we can get a better look at it, uh, the way the GUI looks. So let's go here and run it. Zoom in. There's a place for you to put the total of the bill. And as you're keying that in, it automatically fills in the different table cells. Table cell for the, the tip at 10%, at 15%, and at 20%. There's also a slider control where you can say, all right, hey, that tip was real, or that meal was really good. I'm going to give a 67% tip on it. And in which case it then calculates the tip and that. So you have your sort of standard amounts of what you would tip based on the bill total. And then you would have sort of your custom amount based on the slider control. Um, notice that there's no button here like there was in mine. All right, mine there was a button that invoked the 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 act. All right, that it, that went and invoked the the calculation. All right, um, I would argue that makes sense for mine because in mine there were several fields to enter in, and then you want to go to do the calculation. Whereas this design is a little bit different because you're really only filling in that one and you're either looking at the standard amounts or you can slide the, the custom controller back and forth. So do notice that. But again, notice that each of these is a row in the table. So the first row consists of the um, label for bill total, the second row consists of the, the percent headings, the third row consists of the tip with the, with the three text views, total with the three text views, the label custom, the slider control, and a, a label to show the, the amount, and then so on down the line. All right. Sure. Okay. I'm not sure I understand the question. So why is the tip take up less room? Tip text take up less room. Column. No, column that tip. 
why is this yeah, why is narrower? narrower than this, this, and this? Or for that matter, this is also narrower than that. that where, where is the I don't know. Let's look. Well, let's look. Let, pardon me? Well, let, let's look. All right, let's look at this. All right. In the first row, we have a something that says the um, we have we have a label for um, amount of bill, and then we have a text, an edit text view to enter in the amount. So our first row are these two things. All right. Have we put the size on anything? No. All we've said is that we want the word text view here. We want to push it. We have the word text view here, or rather here. We want to push it to the right, and we want padding of the right of 5 pixels, 5 dp. And we'll come to what dp is in a few minutes here. All right. Now. Under the edit text, we have, um, we've said that this is going to span three columns, which it does, right? This covers this, this, and this. All right? Where do you see that? Ah, there we go. Right. Right. Well, to fill the available space, to fill the width going across. Based on the size of the word in there. Let, let's go and let's make the word bigger. Um, that is... Bill total. So let's go in here and let's say bill total for the meal in question. All right, so we made it a lot bigger. Let's go and run this now. Just changing the string, right. So now I go and run this. Does it sting? All right. Now notice what happened. Well, where do you? Where, let's see. Which one is that on? Um. So layout with wrap content. You're asking what that means. Let's Google it. Let's find out for sure. They can probably give a more precise definition than I could. So let's go in here.
setting a view size to wrap content will force it to expand only far enough to contain the values it contains. For controls like text boxes and images, this will wrap the text or images being shown. All right. So don't think of wrap. Don't think of wrap as like wrap around, like you think of it. Think of wrap as it will go around that. But we said to stretch those columns in the in the original one. So that's that's essentially what does it. If you want some specific width, you can do that via again. That's not your only choices. You can uh, specify. You can say percentage, you can specify in terms of DPs. Um, you have a lot of different uh, possibilities um, for that. All right. Here they show it as being, you know, 100 D DPs. So you have a lot of options as far as how to do it. My guess is that because this is a table layout, you have you have to specify like what you're going to stretch to fill in that whole table role. All right. All right. So, we have our different table rows that contain <coughs> that contain the, um, the the different elements. The second row then contains the, the um, or row two rather, which is the third row, contains the label. I, I call it label. It's actually a text view for the word tip. And then the three edit texts um, to uh, display uh, the, the tip for the various percentages. Notice that you can't focus in it, so you can't actually get in it to edit it. All right. So it's really just more like a display uh, field. And the rest of the layout. To be sure, I don't consider myself an expert on these Android layouts. That, you know, it's going to take time, I think, uh, you know, to go through this and, and do some research. Because there is a lot of properties that you can, you can use and you can set them for. All right. The one thing I do want to mention, though, under padding, they have 5DP. What is a DP? Density independent pixels. That's why you notice in one of the other examples that I pulled up a minute ago, I had DIP. And that's the same thing, density independent pixels. What is a density independent pixel? And, and how do you use it? Okay. Okay. Anyone want to add to that? What it is is it it, it you know it, it's sort of like relative to 160 pixels across. Okay. So, for example, if I were to make uh, an element in my layout 80 dp, that would be 80 pixels based on 160 pixels. 
So what my actual screen size was then it essentially is like 50% of the, of, the, of the width of the screen. So I could say 80 pixels, uh, 80 dp rather, if my screen then was 480 pixels wide or 300 pixels wide, it would be that proportion. So in the case of 300, it would be 150 pixels. Let's look for uh, an example on that online. All right, pixel is an actual pixel. So if you set something as a pixel, it'll be a real pixel on the screen. DP is de density independent. Units relative to a 160 DPI screen. I'm sorry, I, I said 160 pixels. I meant 160 DPI screen. So one DP is one pixel on 160 pixel screen. So the ratio will change on the screen density, but not directly in in proportion. All right. Scale independent pixels are like DPs except they are responsive to um, the font sizes of the, the user's preferences. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I think I was misstating it. Um, let's look at this calculator. All right. So if I have something that's 160 pixels, all right, if the density was if I was on a medium density machine, again, it's density, not width. That's where I messed that up when I was talking about it. If uh, something is 160 pixels um, on a medium density, um, on a medium density uh, display, 160 pixels would be 160 dp because it's assuming the density is 160 uh, 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 pixels per inch. All right. Um, on a low density, that would translate to 120 pixels. So if I did, on a low density uh, display, if I said it was 160 dp, it would display as actually 120 actual pixels. In other words, the higher the density, the more pixels it will take up. Which makes sense, because the higher the density, the more pixels there are per inch, so you can afford to display it. If there was a higher density and I didn't do this adjustment, on a higher density, things would look tiny, right? Because if it was five pixels across, if it's twice as compacted together, those five pixels would look a lot smaller on a high density versus on a low density or medium density. No. The idea of the DP is so you don't have to do that. Um, does anyone have a pen I can write with? Let's, let's make it real simple. Uh-oh. It's all right. Let's say here is our one density of a screen. Let's say we have, this is our density, whereas a pixel, you know, takes up this much. All right. Let's say this is 160 um, pixels per inch. 
let's go to a 320 then. In a 320, and again, my drawing isn't bright, isn't very good, but a 320, there'd be twice as many pixels, right? So in other words, On 120, there'd be twice as many pixels, or 320 rather. Take two. 160. Three twenty. Twice as many. Twice as many pixels per per inch. The density. Now, let's say I wanted something that was two pixels big. On a hundred sixty pixels per inch, that would take up this much space. On a three twenty, because is twice as dense, it would take up this much space. Well, that isn't good, right? It's like the denser it is, the smaller these things would get to be. Really, in a 320 pixel uh, per inch uh, layout, you can actually display four pixels then, and it'll take up the same size as two would in 160. And that's the idea of the DPs. If instead of making it two pixels, I made it two DP, the 2DP is based on 160 pixels per inch. So 2DP would translate to 2 pixels on, on, the, on, the, on the lower density. On the higher density, it would translate to 4 pixels. All right. And yeah, that's all going on behind the scenes. Yeah. That is confusing. As you, as you noted, I, I mean, I confuse myself by talking about the number of pixels. It's not the number of the pixels. It's the density of the pixels. What to take away from a design perspective is not to use absolute perspective, uh, uh, not to use absolute pixels, not to use real pixels. Use the DPs, and the DP will then um, will, will adjust the number of pixels to make it um, look good regardless of the density. All right. Thanks. All right. SP are apparently like DPs, but they also take into account the user's preference as far as font sizes and all that. Here you go. Okay. Now, there is a whole mess of table properties, again, that we are examining that, you know, for each of these table rows. And for the table layout itself, that I imagine will take a little while to sort of perfect. Now, let's look at the code. There we go. Now let's look at the code for the tip calculator. All right. We have a whole bunch of these variables that we declare. Same sort of thing. This is checking to see if oops, if it's the first time or if this is being restored from memory. Uh, and if it's being restored, what it's doing is it's, it's, it's resetting the state. So it'll keep what it is. So like if you 
flipped it and it's restoring it or if you've gone back or you've opened another application or whatever, it restores those values to what they were. Otherwise, it starts them off at those default values. Here we're using our friend find view by ID to actually hook up the controls that we define in the layout with our objects that we have defined in the code. All right? We have to hook those up together. This resource file that gets generated is used. All right. And that's used in all these statements to hook up our instance variables for this class with their corresponding controls in the GUI. So we have a whole mess of those. Now, we do scroll down. Here we're creating listeners in a slightly different way than we did in the previous example. But we're creating listeners both for the text area, where they're typing in the, the values for the text, and for that slider control on that seek bar. Yeah, these are all these are all things that are going to go in and and find and, and and handle the events as they occur. Yeah, the text watcher is what happens when you key something in. The um, seek is where we slide the slide the bar. Notice, let's look first at the text watcher. The text watcher, again, is set so that when something is entered, it goes and it grabs the values and it calls the update standard and the update custom. So, what that accomplishes is, as I type something in here, Every time I type something in that, it fires that event, that text changed event or method fires off, it grabs a value from it, and it calls the method to both update the table here and to update this setting here. Like, for example, if I put my custom tip slider if I slide it to 26% for whatever reason. As I put a value in there, it recalculates all these different things. So it, up, uh, it calculates the standard amount and it calculates the custom amount. There are a couple of, of functions that um, aren't there. They're probably there simply to implement the interface. After text changed and, and before text changed. Likewise, there's an on starting track uh, touch and on stop tracking touch. We ignore that and we simply look at that. 
and we grab uh, on the slider bar, we grab the progress of the seek bar, and then we call the update custom method. And the update custom method takes the position of the seek bar and translates it to a percentage and uh, then does the, does the math to display that. Right. Questions about any of this? I know there's a lot to digest. You probably want to go and yeah, you probably want to go and take this and break it down um, a step at a time. Um, Okay, this is what I was missing in my first glance of it. This is where we assign that text change listener to that text box right there. I saw the function, but I scrolled right past that, so I was confused for a second. So here we describe our text watcher class, all right, as a bill edit text watcher, and we define that as a new text watcher, and we then put in the values for those functions. But here is where we associate here is where we associate that class with um, that text uh, text view or that edit text view, and here is where we associate the seek bar with that seek bar listener. Okay. That's that that would be more correctly described as an inner class. All right. Uh, an anonymous class doesn't have a class name. So if you notice the one I did last time. I said something like equals new, and then I went and I didn't even define a, a class for it. Here we've de we've declined, or I'm sorry, we've defined inside of this class another class, and those are called inner classes. Um, the one thing I will say is good reason for doing which. Yeah. Um, it doesn't muck up the code quite as much. All right. Let's compare the two examples that we have. All right. So let's look at how I did it with an anonymous class. So here I said, yeah, calculate set on click listener equals new, view on click listener, blah, 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 blah. And then smack dab in this routine, I have all my listener code. All the code that gets processed when that button is clicked. So this is what I did with an anonymous class. Now, it's not too bad in this case because there's really nothing after it. All right? But if there was code after this, it'd be really hard to tell at a glance, like if you just saw a line of code there, what the heck that belonged to that that's actually part of the anonymous class as opposed to part of the, that, the, the, the outside method. Here, the code is a little cleaner. All right. Here I say, hey, the listener for that text is that class. Boom. I'm done. Here the listener for that seek bar is this class. Then, there's no question in my mind you know, I don't have a whole mess of code. If I were to do an anonymous class there, there'd be a whole mess of code there, and it would get really confusing as to where that code belonged. This sort of uh, just uh, puts that, that, that code in a separate spa uh, place, so you just say, hey, use that, and then you want to see what happens when, when you change the text? Okay, you look at this code here. All right. 
So it sort of breaks it apart a little bit more cleanly, whereas uh, the approach I took, everything was sort of like in one, one main line. Um, I guess the guideline I would use in doing one versus the other is the complexity of it. The more complex it was, the more I would probably lean towards using uh, an inner class. The more simplistic it was, I'd probably lean towards doing the anonymous class. Oh, good question. Does anyone have an answer for that? Just so the data share? Yes. All right. In other words, let's look at my let's look at my inner class. My inner class. All right. Is somewhere down the line calling update standard. And update standard does what? It Yeah, right, right. But it grabs, it grabs the values from the different things and it updates them. All right. Sets the 15% text. Sets that. If this was a separate class, then these listeners would not have access to all these instance variables of that class. All right. So. Yeah, in, uh, in other words, the inner class has access to the outer class's instance variables just as the anonymous class has access to that. If this was its own separate standalone class, then you'd have to figure out a way to pass and get back. Yeah, I mean, it's really violating right object oriented principles because it's a class that's using private members of it. Yeah, but, 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 yeah but, they're, but they're one happy family, right? <laughs> They're, they're, the, the class is defined inside of the other class, so it's like part of the class. It's almost like a method in a class using the, the instance variables. So, yeah, um, <laughs> for those of you, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say recalling my, my Catholic school background, that that would be a venial sin as opposed to a mortal sin, all right? Okay, right. Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, strictly speaking, yeah, you're probably right. But the thing is, is being, by virtue of being an anonymous class or an inner class, that class can't be used outside of the main class. So you don't run the problems associated with it. They're, they're welded together, all right? And it's okay to do that because if you think of the kind of code that you're writing in these, you're writing code specific for a particular class. This code here, like I called sort of the glue code, we're not going to share in some other uh, classes. Um, we're not going to share in, 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 other, uh, you know, in other situations. This is the code that sort of glues the GUI to the business rules. Um, and, and the bigger violation would be, in my mind, having the tip calculation happen in that code and not calling a, another class to do the tip calculation. Yes. Good, I mean, great point, though. Yeah, the, the private Yes. It's an inner class because it is contained Oops, let's minimize this one. Well, because, yeah, because I'm saying that I have something that's private. It's of type on seek bar listener that equals, and then I say new on seek listener, and I, and I create that. It's, yeah, you're creating, yeah. It's almost like I'm doing here, 
right? I except I'm not creating a new class, I'm just creating a, an object pointer to a, an existing class. All right? Well, it's of class this. Th yes, this is creating an object of this class. Oh. Yeah, you're creating you're creating a variable called a uh, custom seek bar listener, an object reference that's going to be a new one of these that has these attributes. Uh, not, not attributes, these methods associated with it. In, a, in effect, you're creating a class because you're creating methods with this new... You're over, right. you're over... Yeah, right. So, more than likely, we could go back and look. This onseek listener is probably uh, an abstract class that probably has abstract methods on it. And when we create our new one, because that's an abstract class with abstract methods, we have to define those abstract methods. Okay, an interface, right. Well, in, an interface is, is like an abstract class in the fact that you can't instantiate it. So I couldn't simply make a new one of those. I have to make a class that implements that interface and supplies the necessary methods. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Pardon me? But, but anyhow, yeah, that, that's how you know those things. All right. Any questions? Okay. Oh. All right. We, 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 can, we can go up the lab and, and talk about that, or we can stay here. Yeah, because you have your machine here. Other questions, comments? All right, again, Thursday your job is to localize your rock, paper, scissors for some other language. All right? Um, and create, review the, 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 the rules for, or the guidelines, best practices, whatever you want to call them, for creating icons. And you can go in and make an icon for your rock, paper, scissors. That'll be fun. All right? Okay. The icon would be the thing that... Yeah, in other words, uh, on, this, on this tablet, I installed, this is the icon for the tip calculator. This is that. So yeah, that's what you click on to launch the application. So by default, you know, all of these in here have um, have just that little Android guy as as the as the um, the icon. Yeah. Right from the yeah, you'll see it when you yeah when you install it on the device. Yeah, you might see it if you went to the menu on the emulator. Again, I get such bad performance on the emulator that I'm always running on a device. Uh-huh. 
Right. Ah, okay. I'm not really sure you could, well, the, this on an emulator, you say? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Right. Right. Yeah, it's. There, it doesn't necessarily come up. Mine comes up. Yeah, the console's here. It's. it's yeah. Yeah. It would show the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish recording, but don't let that, that stop you asking more questions and continuing the discussion.